Okay. Uh, last time uh, we talked about uh, decidability versus recognizability. We said a uh, machine that decides always accepts or rejects and halts in either case. Um, but if you lift the restriction of halting, it can reject implicitly by running forever or not halting, certainly not accepting, and that gives you more languages that you can recognize. For example, the halting problem you can recognize with such a machine that doesn't halt on a yes, uh, on a no instances of halting by simulation. It just executes the program that's trying to determine if it halts or not. Uh, if it halts, it finds out, reports yes and stops. If it doesn't halt, it keeps simulating, runs forever potentially, but doesn't accept. So uh, the halting problem is recognizable, but not decidable. Uh, so in other words, decidability is a special case of recognizability, and it's easier to recognize than to decide. So we proved a couple of pairs of theorems. Decidability is equivalent to the ability to enumerate in lexicographic order. And it's an if and only if. It's a complete characterization. And similarly, recognizability is the ability to, to enumerate in any order, in some arbitrary order, not necessarily lexicographic order. Okay. And, uh, you know, that allowed us to prove a whole bunch of more theorems. <coughs> um, and we illustrated the fact that recognizability is, is hard. <coughs> and um, we don't even know if, if any integer can be represented as sum of three cubes, for example. So that set of sums of three cubes is, um, uh, whether it's decidable, we don't know. And uh, it's, a, it's an open question. Even for simple uh, elements like 33, still unknown whether it's a sum of three cubes. And 30 is a sum of three cubes in this complicated, convoluted way. So uh, we proved some closure properties. We left off with a bunch of theorems in quick succession. Right? We proved that the decidable languages are closed under union, uh, intersection, um, complementation, concatenation, and clean star. Right? It's a lot of closer, closure properties there. Uh, on the other hand, the recognizable languages, they're closed under union and intersection, and, but not complementation. Um, and uh, they're closed under concatenation, uh, and uh, that brings us to the notion of reducibility. That's where we left off. Any questions so far about anything? This is sort of a summary of what we did the last week. So now reducibilities, uh, it's an apparently easy to describe concept, but deep consequences will follow from that very quickly. So um, pay a lot of attention to these definitions. So a language A is reducible to a language B. If there exists some computable mapping, right, from A to B that preserves membership. In other words, if a string is an element of A, its map F is an element of B, and it's an if and only if. So members of A map to members of B, and non-members of A down here will map to non-members of B out here. Okay. Now, how fast you can compute F right now, we don't care. Later, when we talk about NP completeness, we'll compute F in polynomial time. We'll make sure F is an easy to compute function. So F is called a reduction of a language A to a language B. We already know what languages are. We've seen lots of examples of languages. Now we're mapping languages to languages by mapping the elements of one to the elements of another. You'll see soon why, why this is so powerful over concept. It's denoted by less than symbol, but it's highly overloaded. It's not the arithmetic less than or equal to, obviously. It's the reduction notion across languages via mappings. So again, uh, language A is reducible to language B if and only if there is some mapping, a computable mapping. And the word computable here is in red because it's very important that it's a computable function. We already saw plenty of functions that are not computable. This one is computable. And it, map, it, it maps members of A to members of B. So if W is in A, F of W is in B. And conversely, if W is not in A, F of W is not in B. It's an if and only if right here. Okay. So in some sense, what we're saying is that A is no harder than B to compute. Because if, you can comp if you're trying to compute membership in A and you don't know how to do it, but F is computable and you can compute that, in order to see if W is in A, 
let's say you don't know if W is an A or not, map W to B through F, right, and get F of W, and then ask whether F of W is in B. And F of W is in B if and only if W was in A, and vice versa. So if you can compute membership in B, you can compute membership in A. In other words, B is not any easier to compute than A. That's what one of the consequences is right away. So if A is, is, is reducible to B and B is decidable, it implies that A is decidable also. And we just proved that. Again, to summarize why is this true, if you want to decide if W is in A and you don't know how to do it, but you know how to decide whether F of W is in B, take W, run it through F, come up with F of W, decide using that subroutine for decision in B whether F of W is in B, and that'll tell you if W was in A. Right? So if B is decidable, so is A. As long as there's this computable mapping existing from strings in A to strings in B, that preserves membership. That's very important that it preserves membership right here. It's not just any old mapping. And this mapping doesn't have to be one-to-one -one or onto or any particular type. Many things in A can map to the same thing in, in, in B. It can collide in the range. That's OK, as long as members collide, you know, become members and non-members remain non-members through this mapping. Uh, and if A is reducible to B and A is undecidable, then B is undecidable also. Why is that true? Why if A reduces to B and A is undecidable, B can't be decidable also? In fact, give me two different proofs. One proof would be a lot easier than the other. Not that the other is hard, but one will be really straightforward. Yeah? Uh, so if B is decidable, you could decide A by mapping first to B and then decide again. Yeah, so if, if A is undecidable, but B was decidable, you can decide A using B, because F is computable. Right? But a shorter way of saying it is what? And a hint would be rely on the first theorem. Not necessarily. Contrapositive, one word. How many see contrapositive establishes? If A implies B, then not B implies not A. That's true about any two statements. Right? So I'm not, when I say A and B, I don't mean this A and B here. If X implies Y, not Y implies not X. Right? Uh, if it's raining, then the ground is wet. If the ground is not wet, it can't be raining. I'm talking about outdoor ground, not inside, of course. So uh, the second is just a contrapositive of the first. But you can prove it from first principles like we did the first one, too. Just chase it around. Now, about the direction, be very careful which direction you're proving. If A reduces to B, B doesn't necessarily mean that, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that B reduces to A. It may or may not. And if it does, it may not be the same F. Maybe some, some G that has nothing to do with F. Okay. Uh, so, so you have to be careful. Any questions about any of this so far? It's going to get very deep very quickly. This is just you know definitions so far and a couple of m you know obvious theorems about the definitions. By the way, all of NP completeness is based on this diagram. We'll get to that. All right, so let's, let's, let's instantiate these insights with a particular example. Uh, we all already seen that the halting problem is undecidable. There's no algorithm for it. We proved it. But what about the halting problem specific case, the halting problem on the empty string? So now we're not just taking an arbitrary W, an arbitrary uh, uh, machine that runs on W and asks, what does this machine M do on W, arbitrary W, arbitrary M? W is very specifically the empty string. So now we're just asking the halting problem on the empty string. What do machines do on the empty tape or the empty string or no input if it's programs? That, that may be easier than the regular halting problem, right? Because the halting problem is hard 
you know, maybe because it's too general. Um, so you don't know if a program has an infinite loop in it because all the problems are undecidable. But if a program has no loops at all, it has no for statements and no while statements, and it's just straight line code, just assignment statements and print statements and so on. Such programs will halt. They have no way to loop. They have no way to not halt. So the holding problem for specific programs like that is very obviously decidable. In fact, it's trivially decidable. The answer is always yes for straight line codes without loops. Uh, so you see specific, in specific instances of a problem could be much easier than the general instances, obviously. Right? Multiplication by 1 is much easier than multiplication by arbitrary things. Right? Multiplication by 1 just leaves it alone. X times Y is just X. That's easy to compute. But X times Y, you have to have some effort there. So maybe the holding problem on the empty tape, maybe it's easy. It turns out it's just as undecidable as the original. We're about to prove that. that the holding problem on the empty string and the epsilon string is, is undecidable. So it's going to be a reduction, a transformation like we did on a previous slide. But let's be specific. Right? I take an arbitrary Turing machine and input W as an instance of the general halting problem. I'm trying to see uh, whether it halts or not on that arbitrary input W. So I'm going to construct from the M and the W a particular new machine that will do the following if it ran, but it's not running. I'm con just constructing, I'm compiling it, I'm not running it. But this machine, whatever its own input is, because everything has an input, it will ignore it. Hard code the W that's stored in its final control onto the tape, will write it onto the tape, and then simulate the hard-coded machine M on that input W that's already on the tape now, because we put it there, and then accept if and only if the simulation succeeds and M accepts W. So again, this machine here in purple, M prime, that we're constructing from M and W, will ignore its own input x, and then the m and the w are hard-coded into the finite control, into the memory of m prime, they're constants. Right? And it'll just simulate internally m on w, and halt if and only if uh, m halts on w, and that's what it would do. Now, if you ask yourself, what will this machine m prime do on the empty string? It's the same thing they will do on any string, because it ignores its own input and always simulates m on w internally. It's a fixed m on w simulation. Those are hard-coded constants unchanging. So you'll always have the same behavior. m prime will always have the same behavior on any of its inputs, including the empty input. And all those behaviors will be all the same as long as m halts on w, m prime will halt. If m doesn't halt on w, m prime will not halt, regardless of what m prime's input is. Very important to say again, uh, I already said it, but I'll say it again. We're not running M prime. We're constructing it. That if it ran, this is what it would do. But we're not running it. Okay. And now, if we had an oracle, a subroutine, a decision pr process to tell us what M prime will do on the empty string, it would solve us the arbitrary M and W halting problem instance, general instance of the halting problem, M and W. Okay. So a decider for H epsilon, the halting problem on the empty string, epsilon, can be used as a subroutine to solve the general halting problem as well, which means the halting problem on the empty string must also be undecidable. Because if it was decidable, the arbitrary halting problem, general halting problem, would be decidable too. Um, end of proof. So we just proved that the halting problem on the empty string is not any easier than the halting problem on any arbitrary string which is a little odd, because the empty string is very, very specific. In fact, it's, it's trivial. It's nothing. Uh, how many understand all this? I mean, that's, a, that's a lot to take in the first time you see it. Uh, any questions about this? I only saw a third of you say you understand it. So let's, let's go through it again. Um, somebody give me a couple of blank sheets. Uh, I could use a prop here. Um, you know, if it's easier for the loose bit, yeah, that's good. Okay.
bear with me, it'll be worth it. Okay. So, so we're about to prove isosteme. All non-trivial properties of recognizable languages, all these properties, uncountable number of these properties, they're, they're not decidable. None of them are. All right. So we're going to let P be some non-trivial property. But non-trivial means it's not the empty property, and it's not the property containing all recognizable languages. So without loss of generality, assume that the empty set is not an element of P. Otherwise, prove it for the complement of P. Because a set is, a language is decidable if and only if its complement is decidable. Right? Together they stand, together they fall with respect to decidability. If you can decide something, you can decide its complement by negating the answer for the, for the other. So uh, let some language be an element of this property that's not trivial. And let L not be the empty language, because we already said that the empty language is not in P without loss of generality. Otherwise, go through the remainder of the theorem, not with P, but with the complement of P. Right? Okay, So we can pick some language that's not empty that's one of the languages in this property. Remember, the property is just a, a set of languages. So we're going to take one of them, call it L, and make sure it's not empty because of this assumption. And that's how we move forward with this. Right? So let this, some machine recognize L, and we'll call it machine M sub L. It recognizes L. Every L is a Turing machine language, is a recognizable language. So let M sub L recognize L. It's just notation. We're calling it something. The machine that recognizes L. We're just giving it a name so we can refer to it. So the language of M sub L is equal to L by definition, and it's not the empty language. Okay. So now assume there exists some algorithm or Turing machine that decides this property. In comes in a language, and the language is really a Turing machine description, or if you want a grammar, or however you want to express a language. Let's say it's a Turing machine. And the language that comes in is the language accepted by or recognized by this Turing machine. And this, this oracle, this subroutine that's supposed to decide the um, property P, tells us yes or no. Does this language coming in as x have this property P? In other words, if its language is an element of P. Okay, So I'm just saying again that this x could be a Turing machine description or a grammar or some other, some other thing. Okay. So we're going to use this machine that determines this property as, an, as a solver for the halting problem, same as we did in the previous example. In fact, this whole proof that we're going through generalizes the other three examples that we already, you know, that we already did. You know, this, these examples here with this m prime and stuff. You'll see how it generalizes it. So L has this property, and let machine sub L recognize this language. Okay? So now we're going to construct an m prime, same as before, that does the following. And again, this generalizes what we did in the pr past three examples. Internally, we're going to embed an arbitrary instance of the halting problem that comes in the door, embedded in m prime, and it hard-coded as constants m machine and w input to that machine. And remember, m prime has its own input x. Everything has its own input, right? And m prime has specifically its own input x here in red, color-coded. Right? So internally, what we'll do is m prime will simulate m and w, same as before. Arbitrary instance of the halting problem m and w, m, will, m prime will simulate it internally. And if m and w halts, this will then the halting condition will fire up this machine here, m sub l, that recognizes l, and it will take x as an input into itself. Right? And if m sub l 
says yes, M prime says yes. Okay, so now think about what the language of this M prime is. Right? The language of M prime is either the empty language or whatever the language of M sub L is. Right? If M doesn't halt on W, this simulation will never halt, this start button will never be pressed, and nothing will be accepted here, because this won't even run. The simulation here will run forever, and M prime will run forever. So if M doesn't halt on W, the language of M prime is empty. How many see that? Because nothing will get fired up here. The start button won't even be pressed internally. If M, unhold, if M halts on W, on the other hand, right here, this will fire up, and then the language of M prime will be the same as the language of M sub L. Because now it's just simulating M sub L on whatever input. And so the language of M sub L is just L. So the language of M prime will either be L or empty. Based on whether M halts on W. Okay. So M halts on W if and only if the language of M prime has property P. Because remember, L was an element of P. So L has property P. But the empty language doesn't have property P. How do we know? Because we assume that the empty language is not an element of P right here. And if it was, we'd go through the rest of the proof with a complement of P instead of P. That's why we did that assumption at the beginning, to make this work here at the end. Okay. So if we had an algorithm that tell us whether the language of a machine has property P or not, we're gonna, we can exploit it like this into solving the halting problem for us, which we know is undecidable. So whether an arbitrary language, a recognizable language, has property P or not, that's undecidable too. And that generalizes the previous three proofs on, the, on these examples one, two, and three that we saw earlier. Again, we're not running M prime. We're constructing it and then feeding it to the oracle that supposedly solves property P for us. But if the Oracle solves P for us, they're tr being tricked into solving the halting problem for us, which means they can't do their job, too, about property P solutions. Which means property P is not decidable. What was property P? Any property that wasn't a trivial property. Anyone. Any property at all, which is kind of amazing. This is, this is an incredibly powerful theorem. We not only show that we're not a millionaire, we show that we never were, we never will be in any universe, this or any other. I mean, I, I, that's, that's an incredible negative result. It's actually amazing we can, we can have algorithms for anything, given how pessimistic this result is. In particular, the following questions are not decidable, where the language of a Turing machine is empty, or finite, or infinite, or cofinite, or regular, or context-free, or inherently ambiguous, it contains all odd strings, it contains any strings, or is equal to sigma star, or is equal to, to the two words hello and world. All these are undecidable properties of languages or of behaviors of Turing machines. Whether a language is empty complete or not, whether it runs in linear time, whether there's a polynomial time algorithm for it. Now, let me give you this warning very explicitly. This theorem applies to properties, not to other types of objects. It doesn't apply to directly to Turing machines or to uh, grammars directly or to animals or to minerals or to vegetables or to shoes. It applies to properties, to sets of sets, to languages, to recognizable languages, to sets of recognizable languages as properties. Now, you can make it applicable to Turing machines by converting the machine into a language and then asking this question about the language. Now you're asking it about the property, and that's okay, and that part is fine. Just be careful what you apply it to. So here's a misapplication of it. I give you a Turing machine. I say, does this machine have three states or not? And you say, well, by Rice's theorem, it's undecidable, and that's wrong. What went wrong here? Rice's theorem is not applicable to machines. It's applicable to languages. And by the way, prove to me another way that this is wrong. 
that it's not undecidable whether a Turing machine has three states or, or more or less. I have to describe a Turing machine. So look at the description and see how many states it has and compare it to three, and then you'll know. So it's perfectly decidable. There's nothing undecidable about that. But if I ask you a similar question about languages this time, if I ask you, is the language of this three-state Turing machine regular or not, or arbitrary three-state machines, uh, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's undecidable. Or if I say, um, if I say, you know, does, 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 uh, does a Turing machine accept strings of only three characters or less? That's undecidable. Because now we're talking about the languages, the language of these machines, not the actual machines. So just be careful that you don't misapply it to other objects for which it was intended, right? Um, any other questions or comments or issues so far? Yeah. So the whole thing problem is, is a language, or you can at least embed it as a language, right? So by itself, it's not doesn't have the right type of a property. A property is a set of sets. The halting problem is a set of strings. So it doesn't even have the right type to be a property. But if you, can t if you want to take the halting problem, which is the language com comprised of all strings corresponding to Turing machine input pairs that, that halt. Right? So it's all strings of that form that halt. And make that the halting problem. And then take that as an element in, in a larger set, put more one more pair of braces around this, it becomes a set of sets, in particular one set, the halting problem set. Now it's a property. So you can shoehorn it into being a property by putting a, you know, an extra set of braces around it. So L is a language. So this is not a property, it's a language. But if you put one more brace around here and here, so you have double braces, now it's a property, because it's a set of sets. So you can shoehorn it and just make sure the type is correct. So basically, it says that almost any question that you can ask about Turing machines is undecidable. More specifically, about the languages of Turing machines. I should you know, make that caveat. Which is kind of amazing. So, so now you see undecidability is everywhere. It's overwhelming. It's overpowering. It, it, you can't get away from it. Very few things actually, very few properties of, of languages are, are actually decidable. In fact, only two are out of an infinity that are not. And that infinity is not even countable. It's uncountable. It's, a, it's about as bad as it gets. And, and, and so what makes those two decidable? Why aren't those two undecidable also? The two trivial ones that are the exception to this rule? Because you can give a one, one line answer to each one of those. So you can't get away from the decidability of these two trivial ones, because it's always true, always false. That's easy to decide. Always say yes, or always say no, and you'd be always right. Like the clock that's, that's broken. You know? um, a clock that's broken is a very simple algorithm for keeping time, as long as you're allowed to be incorrect sometimes. Right? OK, any, any questions about any of this? Is, this is deep. Okay, not, this is deep waters here. This is not obvious. This is not straightforward. It's, uh, it's not long. It's just a few slides. It's not like we had to spend you know, a month on this. You know, in an hour, we kind of described it, including all these examples ahead of time. But this is, this is subtle. It's almost like a meta theorem, right? It doesn't tell you that something specific is undecidable. It tells you that all these things are undecidable, all in one fell swoop. Um, and um, you know, in the book, it's 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 couched as a problem. Five point two eight Rice's theorem. And it asks you to prove this as a theorem, as an exercise. I admit that is not a trivial thing. 
you know. So, uh, of course, it also answers it here later. But there is a star by this problem, so the book acknowledges this problem is not easy, uh, and even gives you an answer. And then it uses Weiss's theorem to do other things. But it says is in the book on page two hundred thirteen, and of course the halting problem is there too, and around page one seventy two, section four. It's, but this is into chapter five already. Okay, any questions or issues? Uh, is it crystal clear? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so first of all, trivial properties, we have a separate proof that they're decidable. There's one line algorithms. Uh, but the, 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 it's asking a very good question. What part of this would break if you try to ram through the trivial property through here? Well, a trivial property will be equal to the empty set. And so you couldn't say that the language Uh, the, the language will, will always be empty. It wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be something other than empty. So you couldn't d distinguish the output, you know, the output, the, the language of M prime as empty or not empty, uh, you know, equal to, or as having the property or not having the property. And so feeding that to the oracle is not going to disambiguate whether the machine halted on, the machine M halted on W or not, because the language here uh, it, will, it will be empty if M didn't halt on W, but if it halted on W and you ram it through here, it'll be empty again because that property is empty. Uh, so the oracle couldn't disambiguate that for you and it wouldn't be any wiser. The oracle will always say, oh, you know, it, 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 you know, it doesn't have that property or it has that. It will be the same answer either case. The oracle wouldn't disambiguate these two cases of M halting and M not halting because the language of M prime will be the same in either case. So that's why. That's, so that's why we had to make this assumption that the language is not empty. In other words, the, the, you know, we, we, at the beginning, we said uh, that the empty language is not an element of the property. And if it, and if, and if it was, uh, this disambiguation wouldn't occur and the reduction would, would break. Now, you wouldn't get a contradiction, you just wouldn't get a proof. It just would fail to produce an algorithm based on a subroutine that resolves that property, supposedly. You know, we wouldn't get a subroutine for the halting problem. That's, that's a good question. He's asking kind of what would happen if um, you try to ram this through with one of the two trivial properties. It wouldn't be something terrible that happens. You just wouldn't get a proof. That's all. And sure enough, we already know that the Two tri trivial properties are decidable because each one has a one-line algorithm that decides it. So it's, you know, it matches what we already know. OK, what else? Now, there's a version of Rice's theorem that tells you whether a property, what, what properties of decidable languages are decidable not just what properties of recognizable languages are decidable. That one is much harder. It has several different conditions. All of, you know. So I'm just mentioning it. There's a version that's even more complicated than this. And that addresses what properties are decidable when they're properties of not just recognizable languages, but decidable languages. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, that's that's, that's, uh, that's a even a deeper results, the result than this. Okay. Uh, bottom line is it's, it's, it's undecidable to determine hardly any property of recognizable sets other than the two trivial properties are always true, always false. So here's a map again of the Chomsky hierarchy. Here's where we are, right? This course is uh, you know, all about this single slide, right? The Chomsky hierarchy and all these. This is a Venn diagram, set containment diagram. So we talked about regular languages like A star. Right, then we talked about deterministic context free language like A to the N, B to the N. The green ones are examples of languages that are in one class but not subsets, proper subset classes. So, for example, panandromes are context free but not deterministic context free, and certainly they're not regular. And, uh, you know, 
here's P and NP, polynomial time and non deterministic polynomial time. We'll talk about that separately at length. But languages like A to the N, B to the N, C to the N are easily the determinant, you know, determinant in polynomial time if strings are in fact linear time, not just polynomial time, deterministically, but they're not context free and they're not regular either. Then there's context sensitive languages, polynomial space, exponential time. And out there is the decidable languages in red. So the languages which are decidable but not context free. In fact, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N is decidable but not context free. Right? Um, and then there's lots of other classes here of complete problems. Again, we're talking about incompleteness. We'll, we'll dive deeper into these classes. And then there's language which is recognizable. So recognizable is a superset of the decidable. It's a proper superset, or the decidable is a proper subset, conversely, of the recognizable languages. And I'm giving you examples of those, like the halting problem H is recognizable, but not decidable. So we proved that the halting problem is not decidable, so it's, it's a Venn diagram, set containment. So it's outside this circle here of the decidable languages, H, the halting problem. But it is in the recognizable language, because you can recognize halting instances where you see them by simulation. And we talked about languages which are not recognizable. For example, the complement of H, H bar, is not recognizable. Because a language is recognizable if and only if its complement is recognizable. In, uh, uh, excuse me, a language is decidable if and only if its complement is decidable. So if both language like H and its complement, H bar, are both recognizable, both will be decidable run the deciders or the recognizers for both in parallel, one of them will stop first, and then you'll know if it's in or outside the language. And that's the decider. So H is recognizable, but not decidable. The complement of the halting problem is not even recognizable, much less decidable. So that's where H and H bar sit right here, way outside you know, these circles. This, it's so far way out there that it's hard to even describe how far out they are. They're impossible to solve algorithmically. Right? Everything in the decidable circle, there's algorithms for. Right? Not necessarily efficient algorithms, but algorithms nevertheless. Everything outside the decidable circle, there's no algorithms for. Right? And there are things that are not just not, dis not recognizable, but they're not even finitely describable right here. Those are even worse. Not only you can't solve them, can't even describe them to begin with. It's, it's worse than not being able to solve something. It's not even being able to state the problem by in finite terms. Right? That, that's, that's how complicated that is. And it, there's a whole bunch of things here that are called Turing degrees. And we haven't talked about that yet, but maybe we will at some point. And of course, out here, this big circle out there, the very uh, outside circle in blue here, 2 to the sigma star. What does that mean? Set of all languages. How many languages are there there in 2 to the sigma star? Uncountable. Uncountable. How many languages are in the decidable? Countable. countable. Like all the algorithms, all the terms. You can dovetail, you can enumerate them countably. So most languages are not decidable. Most languages there are no algorithms for. Most are not even recognizable. Because they're recognizable languages, that's countable too. Recognizable language is simply the one that the Turing machine stops and says yes on. Right? And the Turing machines are countable. So there's an uncountable number of non-recognizable languages, and in fact, not finitely describable languages. So th there's a lot going on in this diagram. It's just a Venn diagram, it's set containment. Most of these containments are proper. Some, we don't know if they're proper or not. For example, this containment here, we don't know if this is a proper subset here or not. P is equal to NP or not. We know P is a subset of NP, but we don't know if it's equal to it. So it's still a valid Venn diagram, but this region out here, this region here, we don't know if it's empty or not. That's an open question. It's worth a million dollars from the Clay Institute. In fact, we don't even know if P space is equal to NP or not. So the P space can collapse to P. There's no proof that any of these regions are actually empty or not empty. Doesn't mean that this diagram is wrong. This diagram shows Venn diagram of set containments. But for some of these sets, we don't know if it's proper containment or not. Is this a proper containment right here? Absolutely. Some regular languages are not finite, like this one. Is this a proper containment? Absolutely. 
so some languages are deterministic, context-free, but not regular. Is this proper containment? Yeah. Some context-free languages cannot be determined, cannot be decided with a deterministic algorithm or by a, um, but But P and NP, we don't know if that's proper. We don't know if this is proper. We don't know if this is proper. We know that X time and P, that's proper. But we don't know where the properness kicks in, in, in the intermediate levels. But we know that X time, exponential time, is not the same as polynomial time. There's languages that cannot be de decided in polynomial time, but can be decided in exponential time. They're, they're, they're all decidable, but not within polynomial time. We know that exponential space is properly containing p polynomial space. That much we know. This, these come from space, space and time hierarchy theorems. Later in the course, we'll prove that if you have two decidable or computable functions that asymptotically are different than one another, there's always languages that can be recognized within the higher time or space bound, but not within the lower spy time or space bound. We will prove that. Okay. And by the way, this diagram gets a lot more complicated than, than what you're seeing here. I'm just showing you the simplified version. Um, there's a lot of other classes in between here. And a lot of hierarchies, even infinite hierarchies, like between p space and p, there's the polynomial hierarchy. It's an infinite number of levels. It's hard to draw in a single slide, an infinite number of circles all enclosing one another. But there's a lot more things going on here that I'm actually showing. I'm just showing you sort of the major milestones, the major classical classes of problems. And, but there's hundreds and hundreds of other classes that have names, like p and np and p space. And, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, later in the course, I'll show you a much more complete diagram, and that'll be a big eyeful. Just to, you know, to, to, just to 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 look at that thing is quite formidable. Okay. Anything else so far about any of this? So, so again, this is sort of the touchstone, this map, this roadmap of where in the course we've been, where we're going, where we are right now. And later, we'll talk about P and NP more specifically, and time and space complexity classes, and you know hierarchies of classes, and explore some of these other classes here, and plus a whole bunch of other things. Um, and that'll be pretty fun and exciting. Uh, all right, uh, let's take a short break, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, say 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, regroup here, and uh, plow through the next. Uh, segment, which will start with context-free grammars. Excuse me, context-sensitive grammars, I should say. Context-free, we've already done.